what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm the crossing guard in the Mono Park Park. <laughs> I have the little kids across the street. Uh, I've been uh, forging blades for 50 years. I started in the late 60s, and uh, my name is Henning Wilkerson. <laughs> anyway, I, I started in the late 60s. I was working in an aircraft plant, and I, I, I got to do some unusual things. I, I built the big pressure domes for the inside of the Saturn rockets. Some of that stuff just went in way out in space. And I helped build the first 747 tail section vertical called satellite that was ever built right out of high school. And then, uh, and, uh, in the beginning, the uh, first piece of hot iron I forged, I was in the seventh grade. And everybody says, well, you're highly educated, you know all this metallurgy. When I was in school, I found grades I liked, and I'd just stay in them. <laughs> they, they didn't know what to do with a kid like me, because they got all these uh, these things look like PhD degrees behind you, and you got ADD, and I was an EFG or something. Anyway, they couldn't figure it out. And uh, so I escaped school, and it became well-read. And that's what saved me. But anyway, uh, I made some knife-shaped objects in the 60s because you didn't know anything about heat treating. And every southern male in the United States is a frustrated knife maker. Some more frustrated than others. Anyway, I would take these bars of stainless steel. And I, yeah, you told me about that evil part. Anyway, <laughs> anyway I didn't even know you heat treated this stuff. I ground out a thing that was shaped like a knife, so I called it a knife-shaped object. Anyway, that quickly went to the white side, and I moved on with life. And then and, uh, I moved to Florida in 1970. In 1972, I, I got in a heavy rigging company with the Boilermakers Union, and we were moving huge 500,000-pound uh, loads over the road and setting things in place and stuff. And there was uh, Boilermakers, iron ship fitters, and blacksmiths. And there were no blacksmiths left. They were all gone. They were all gone. And I, 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 it was interesting. So I, I bought a little book uh, by Alex Beeler called The Art of the uh, Art of the, uh, Blacksmith, I think is the name of it. And I opened the book, and there was a page and a quarter on forging blade. And I don't know, something struck me. And then so I, I ran out and I bought the, uh, a little rivet forge and an anvil. And I went home and I started making blades. Well, the people tell you you can't destroy an animal. Well, I can guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. When you take cross-cut saw blades and heat them up red hot and you cut them out with a chisel on your animal face, it destroys the animal. And what it does, it puts a nice texture in everything you hit it because it then turns it into an embossing dye. Anyway, I found that out. And I, uh, I, I made a, a few of these uh, fillet knives and they were, uh, and they cut like crazy because that L6, is very forgiving. You can you can you can cheat at heat treat. You heat it up red hot. You dip it in a bit of oil, wave it over the fire, and it cuts like crazy. It's just it was just luck. Anyway, my friends told me I was wonderful, so I assumed that I was. And uh, so I was selling these things for fifteen and twenty dollars a piece. I couldn't believe people would pay me that much money for these knives. But anyway, I was doing. I was using broom handles and bits of hammer handles. <coughs> And I'd go uh, sneak the ground wires off the power lines and uh, cut that quarter inch wire and make my rivets. And I set them with a four pound hammer, which filters into another story a little later on. But anyway, I heard about a guy up on a job that made knives. So I worked, it was 111 miles up there. And I, anyway, I was working there. And so I went to look him up. And in my youthful arrogance, I had three of these old knives and an old snotty rag in my hip pocket. And I, I'm thinking, I'm gonna go teach this guy something about making knives. That's what I'm thinking, okay? Because I'm young and stupid and uh, no experience. And I walked up to this guy and he's leaning up against a, a big acid tank eating lunch. His name's Bobby Tyson. And I said, I hear you make knives. And he says, oh yeah, I'm a real humble guy. Pulled out the most beautiful pocket knife I've ever seen. That thing walked and talked and did everything and had uh, bone handles on it and a uh, uh, mirror polished uh, and it made out of some magic steel called D2. I'd never heard of that stuff. You know, it, I, I saw blade was the only steel I knew and car springs. And uh, anyway, so he was real nice and he, 
He says, uh, you make knives. I, I'm trying to get away from him. I don't want to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I pull these, these old, three old, old knives out of this old snotty handkerchief. <laughs> I had him to him. Oh, I tell you, he was kind. And then he made a fatal mistake. He said, I have books on knives. And I said, you have what? Books on them. There are books on them. So where do you live? He said, Jacksonville, Florida. And I said, what's your address? And that's where he made the other mistake. I moved in with that guy. I went up to him. I said, can I come up? I came up. I went to his shop. And he moved me from doing that crude stuff to finishing knives. He moved me five years forward in the weekend. And that's what these young guys, they have access to all this information. When I started forging, there was a half a dozen guys in all of the U.S. that were forging blades. And they weren't talking to anybody, and they rarely knew each other. And there was like six guys worldwide that I knew, that we knew about. Now, maybe it's on up in the mountains and, and northern Indian and all that stuff. They were all still forging doing pattern well, but nobody in, in our known world was doing it. There were about six guys, and only one of them really talked to me. One of them talked to me once while, but one of them was actually talking to Daryl Meyer. And uh, he was one of the pioneers of the mosaic stuff. He had a group that was put together up in Carbondale, Illinois, and it was him and uh, 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 Wallace, Jim Wallace, and then Bill Ferrini, and it was one other guy. I can't remember who he is. But they were doing heavy duty research. And then in 1976, Bill Graham was doing pattern welding, and he reintroduced it in the knife industry to the world. And so there was two competitive uh, little competition there. And of course, you know how rivalries, rivalries uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's, that's a little bit of the history of that. And that started coming on, and then we started developing pattern. Well, I wasn't satisfied with ordinary stuff. Everybody was doing just folded rim and stuff. And I, I had a guy that was instructing me on forge welding. Now everybody thinks that I spent years and years in Pendrake shop. We were friends for years and years and years. But my lesson in forge welding was four hours. And it was 88 miles away. And I drove over there to Pendrake shop. If I get to Ramblin, he'll correct me. Hey, uh, I'm using the other shelf. If you ask me, he's been following me around so long that any question that I can't answer, he can do it. <laughs> but anyway, I went over there and his dad was still active. And they were in the horseshoeing business. And there were probably six guys or seven, eight guys around that area. And they made all their own tools in the shop. And they did it by welding up, forge welding up little bits and pieces. If you etch those hammers and tongs and stuff, they're Damascus. They're layered material. That's been going on since the beginning of time. Anyway, I went over there. And I want to forge weld because everything I tried to weld my forge looked like a canvas a whole stick. Then, uh, so I got this canvas on a stick, and I, I didn't know what to do. So I go over there and I build a. I used coal fire then, and Mr. John, he's sitting in a chair, no cowboy, he's sitting in a chair reading papers, got it back to me. And I'm over there heating this iron up in the fire. He said, you got it too hot. How did he know it? Not even looking at me. Well, he was looking at the sparks reflecting in the tent. I uh, had it too far down the fire, burned the end of the sparks. Flat the bar out. Okay. And I go to the anvil and I start working. He's too cold. <laughs> Man. Anyway, I, I got a forge welder, and I knew how to forge well, and I went home and the rest of it was history. I, uh, I started putting stuff together, and I would uh, do, I was doing uh, all the random stuff, but I wanted to do the Merovingian stuff. Daryl and them were researching that a little bit, and uh, doing the multi-bar twists and stuff. And I showed up in 1980 in New York with multi-bar stuff. And uh, my knives were still really crude. I mean, there's not, I mean, they were below anything in that room upstairs, but they had cool steel. 
And uh, anyway, so I, I went to my, one of my teachers, Jimmy Smith, and I showed him my work. He said, let me see your knife. And he had a big booming voice. And, well, he said, uh, if your knives ever catch up here with your steel, you'll be a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> 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 He was also the guy that put firework on the map. And uh, so as my knives progressed, and of course I made probably 40 pocket knives before I made one I could sell without a pair of pliers. So open it. And you had to have time to open it. And they go, why the springs are strong? It's a manly knife. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you can't open that, you're not a man. Anyway, anyway we worked with it a bit. And uh, so it, uh, I, you know, every, one thing leads to another, and uh, the inquisitive mind following and, and developing stuff. And I, I got to doing really ornate patterns, and then I, I came upon the, the mosaic thing, and I started doing that by stacking square rods. And I was stacking the square rods like they were doing in Liège, Belgium. And I studied that work in Liège, and I was also uh, studying ancient uh, Egyptian glasswork, who did all the pictures and the mosaics that you see today in glass in ancient Egypt. And that whole process was lost for 400 years. And then the Italians rediscovered it. And that's where Murano, the stuff in Murano came from, all that Millefiori glass. I got a hold of a, uh, the people that bought my first mosaic knife is Aldo and Ada Lorenzi. And they owned a shop in, uh, in uh, Milano. And it's like uh, a rodeo drive. And they had these high end knives in there. And they bought my first mosaic knife. I actually have a picture of it. And it had this grid pattern on it. And I was layering the, the grid over a cutting board. Every one of my knives, no matter how ornate it is, or simple it is, it has a cutting edge. It's a tool first, and then it's a knife. Amen. If if that otherwise, it's not a knife. It's Amen. a knife-shaped sculpture, Amen. and that's the one thing you have to be careful when you uh, put nickel in. If you put nickel across a cutting edge, it'll roll over like an old cat on his belly rub, and, and the customer's not happy. <laughs> anyway, I did that, and I studied that glass work, and she. The only book on that on that Murano glass was in Italian. And she went through that book and did all the connotations in the margin in English with a pencil and mailed me that book. I went crazy in there. I repeated all those little patterns. And uh, and I and then uh, there was a few more guys starting to tinker with it. And then we started fooling with trying to figure out how to weld all this stuff together. And so we came up with a canister idea, and Daryl and I started with that canister stuff about the same time. And, and the problem with, quote, inventing things is you don't know whether somebody else has previously invented this thing because they're solutions. And uh, one of the examples I use, I use a lapping method. Is there a pen on this thing? Uh, I use a lapping method. And if you see all my early blades, and I brought some pictures in that book there in your book, and I don't draw, so you don't laugh out loud. I'm easily offended. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> like this. And you saw those off. Okay, and, and this is, this is going to be my one negative jab. Today they take a bar of steel and they cut it on a bias because the picture when you do a mosaic it's in the end of the bar and how do you get that to the face of the bar and the solution for that for me was to cut these off turn them and grind them and stack them and now you're you've got a center core because i wanted a cutting edge because a lot i use a lot of nickel in there because it's very bright but it won't cut so i use either a 52 100 core or a layered uh, high carbon core in there so it cut, and then you've got the opposite thing on the other side, and you stack all these together, and I would, I would race, you know, there's a little trick, and then I'm sharing this with you, you guys, and I don't show this to everybody, it's fairly common knowledge, but it, it's, I don't share it with everybody, 
is I don't butt these flat up. I always raise these up just a little bit. Every one of these will be up just a little bit. And you tack weld here, and you tack weld there, and you tack weld here, and this on a rod. And what happens is it causes that scarf weld to bite. When it goes down, it bites and it welds. They're much stronger weld. If you try to put them together, you normally it will get a little crack or a coal shot or a bite or toss. That stops that. That absolutely stops that. This scarf weld has been around since they put the first two pieces of iron together. That's nothing new. The application was here. Okay, and everybody says, well, I did that in 1980. The guy that discovered this flip made his first knife in 1995. That's when he discovered that process. And I went, okay. And it irritated me. I was young and it irritated me a little bit that, that he, he claimed this thing. And I went, okay, that's the problem with it. And so now I've got all the stuff I've done in 1980 and I'm writing the article in the history of Mosaic Steel for the knives book, uh, knives 19, uh, 2019 or 18, there's some one of them. And I've got a, a, a young guy that was a student of mine 25 years ago named Rick Furrier. And you've seen him on, uh, on television on the secrets of the Viking sword. He recreated those Merovingian blades. He was a student. Well, guess what? Now he's my teacher. I call that kid whenever I'm in trouble on material science or ancient research, I go back to him every time because he's smart and he remembers stuff. Anyway, he's, I, was, I was talking about this for that article and he says, let me send you something before you publish that. I said, okay. He sent me the article and it was about a Javanese smith and the guy just died. So I don't know how old he was, but he was one of the mystical smiths. And he was using that exact technique and the thing that the paper was published in the 90s, using that exact same technique to put some of those Javanese blades together. Now, I have no idea how old he was or how far back in time he was using that or whether his father's father had taught him because they came in a, in a succession. But I have no idea how old that is. It's a solution to a problem that was started halfway around the world. Everybody is smart. They have a, may have a different culture, different language, a different formality about the work, but it's a solution to a problem. And that's what we do as bladesmiths and knife makers is find solutions to problem. And that's what I want to impart because that's where my world is, is finding a way to make it happen. Uh, you, oh, Darrell Meyer used to, that whole shooting scene I did with a man and a dog and a bird with a gun barrel was a challenge from Darrell. I was doing all these mosaic patterns. I was doing the lettering in it. And Darrell and I had a difference of opinion. He thought if you put the lettering in and you twisted it, and of course you, when you twist steel, it's like stacking a bunch of coil springs. And when you cut through that, you begin to expose a positive and a negative. And then what you see is the quote, the star, that's the center of that core that's not moving. So the tighter you twist it, the more of those images you get, but you get positive and negative. This way it's really hard to write in a twist because one half will be backwards. It'll be, you have to read it in the mirror. Anyway, so we had an argument on what, and so the term for mosaic for me is anything that's tile-like. You put tiles on it. And so I was doing all the stuff and he says, why don't you make something that's real? And that's when I did that uh, the shooting scene. That's real. And that was difficult too. It's the most difficult pattern I've ever done. And that's the reason I'm here is to show him exactly the method, how I did it. And then he'll carry it, he's young enough to carry it on and teach it. And so that's what we're doing. But anyway, that's the way this works. Uh, then I, uh, I came along and we were doing canister stuff. And uh, so I, I was trying to figure out how to do it. And uh, so what I came up with is I was taking uh, uh, Freon gauges off a car that you put Freon in. And I had a uh, stainless steel metal tube that was blocked off and I had fittings. And I had a, a, a vacuum pump and CO2 gas on there because I could get it free from the telephone man. He would throw the tanks off my driveway and I'd drag them in the back. And then anyway, I don't guess that was legal, but anyway. <laughs> and so what I did is I had a friend, his name's Joe Heidebeck, that had a wire machine. 
And I love those jokes because he would tolerate my craziness. And uh, wire machines cost a lot of money and they're very expensive to run. And they're slow, it's like watching grass grow. Anyway, so I had him cut my name out in a block. And I'd just gone up to, uh, I taught a class this early, early on. And uh, I taught a class at uh, a company <coughs> called Teledyne. And they made all kinds of powder metal stuff. They made projectiles, cluster bomb parts, uh, carbide tooling, all out of powder metal. And I've seen that, and then I went, it was at the first Batson hammer in at his house. Gary was there, and he was the top powder metal guy for Teledyne. And, uh, and anybody knows Gary knows he's, he's super, he's a brilliant guy. He's a trained geologist, but he knows more about powdered metals than almost anybody on the planet. And he was up there, and he was trying to mix borax and nickel powder and wick it into a piece of cable. And I was already doing canister work, so I went over to him and he said, can you help me with this? I said, yeah, get a piece of pipe, we'll weld the end on it, we'll stuff that thing in there and it'll weld. And it did. And he was tickled to death with it. And then, so he invited me up to teach a, a knife class at Teledyne. And I said, well, you know, why am I teaching a knife class? Well, what happens in these corporations is they bring in a complete widget, one of these. And this thing gets broken up. And you, uh, one guy gets a blueprint, and a machine shop gets a print, and another guy gets a print, and this thing is all segmented, and it's all through the plant. But these guys aren't talking to each other. They've got no connection to what comes out in the box at the end of the plant. So I did a knife class, start to finish. Here's the raw stock, comes in, you do this bit, you do that bit, and they're doing it as a committee. I'm doing it as one guy. And then I've got a finished knife and they go, oh yeah, I'm part of this whole thing. So it pulls that whole mental draw of that corporation back together. And now they're a team. They're no longer, well, you know, if those guys would just get my parts in here, I'd get through and man, it's all shift change. I got to walk, you know, it stopped a lot of that. So that's what I did, but I had access to millions of dollars worth of equipment. I've got a picture of an SEM of that signature. Anyway, rambling back, I see the powder, I go to Joe, and I have him cut my name out. And I take this thing home, and I've got this little 10,000th sheet nickel. And I'm trying to stuff it in that signature, and it won't go. I can't, couldn't make it go. I kept thinning it down and trying to, and it wouldn't go. Because there's little bits in my signature my mom wanted me to be a doctor, so I learned to write like one. That's as close as I got. <laughs> anyway, I had these real loops and stuff, and you had to make all these bits to go in there. And you had to surround them in order to see it. And I've got pictures here I'll pass around you, or y'all come look. Anyway, so <clears throat> I took it over there, and he made the thing. And it, I wouldn't go, so I took it back to him and said, can you cut it in half? I'm going to use it to die. I'm going to force that in there with a hydraulic press. I crushed that thing, and uh, I'll paraphrase Joe when I showed it to him. Golly gee, I wish you hadn't have done that. <laughs> I, I think that's what he said. Anyway, I said, can you make another? I'll paraphrase again. I'd love to. Yeah. Anyway, I had to grow new ears. But anyway, he, 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 he made me another one, and we're sitting there looking at it, putting these little bits in, and he says, too bad we can't pour that in there. We can. <laughs> Have to give me a minute. Change my life. I'll get this good as well. Oh, I'm better now. See him. <laughs> but now it um, it changed my life. What I did with that. And uh, about here it is. Mm. And that book's full of. Oh, it was a good thing. It's a funny story. My kids were all little big guys, and I would be out there smelting this woods in that coal fire, and the roof was so close that if you didn't spray water on it, it would light. Okay, so I'd spray it down, and I'd cast my woods and 
Anyway, one day I made a cake and I sprayed the roof all down and went in and laid down on the couch and I went to sleep. My children came home from school and said, Dad, boy, you must really be working. We could see the smoke from the schoolhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I ran outside and my damn shed's burning down. Anyway, <laughs> and relit. Anyway, I saved it. But uh, anyway, you work on all this stuff and I kind of lost my train of thought there. But that's... Uh, where was I at before you interrupted me? <laughs> anyway, at, uh, it's, it, the whole thing is a creative process. And uh, hey, there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling. Yeah, about the famous thing. Yeah, thank you. I knew I had to hear it for a reason. <laughs> I'll slip you a file. <laughs> anyway, I, I did the little face thing. And uh, this is where <coughs> you got to be careful when you're young and you're coming so that your ego doesn't whip your ass. And so I made this little face thing, and I, I, this is free telephone, free all this stuff. And I get these phone calls from some guys I taught in France. They said, well, this guy's used your idea and won a big national award, and he's giving you no credit for your idea. And being young and stupid, I rose to the bait. So I write this guy a fact. I said, I'm uh, very happy about your award. I'm glad you had good success with my idea. Uh, you know, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got six feet of denial. Um, I did this long before I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, if I had kept my mouth shut, none of this drama would have happened at all because it didn't matter. And uh, so uh, I said, uh, well, I have new ideas. And uh, if you have luck with this, good. I have new ideas. Don't worry about it. By the way, how's the wife and kids? And he wrote back, I seem to have lost something in translation. I said, well, I wrote back, I don't think so. Anyway, I let it drop. And it was a couple of years later, I was in Europe. He comes running up to me with a blade to show me the blade. And I'm looking at it. And you can't tell what it is. But he had a little book that explained what it was. And if you read the book, you can kind of make it out. So I went through all that mental anguish for absolutely no reason. I, just absolutely nothing. And I, I related this to a friend of mine who was a real bright appellate attorney. And he said, I got a poem by Rudyard Kipling that fits this. It's the only poem I ever memorized. He said, they asked me how I did it. I gave the scripture text. You keep your light of burning a little ahead of the neck. They copied all they could follow, but they couldn't copy my mind, so I left them sweating and stealing a year and a half behind. <laughs> so I keep my notes at a grindstone, and I think of new things. And, and, and the, the beauty is, by teaching, I've doubled my life in the business. That's why his damn guard wasn't straight. His handle wasn't straight. And you know what this guy used to do for a living? He was a special operator. He was in the Phoenix program. You couldn't put the bodies he made in this room. And they wanted me to go tell him he failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got a uh, Since Warden, he's replaceable. Okay. Yeah, so I got me and Don Fogg, his old combat there. Most people don't know that about Don. We had to go tell him that he had failed his master's test with the year of the show and all that stuff in the blade, in the, in the metal. And I went up to him and said, Ray, it's just the basics. I said, will you come back? And you tell he wasn't a happy guy. Nobody would be after that man learned. He went, okay, I'll be back. We've been best friends ever since. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what it takes. If you skip those standards, you have to, it's, it, art is a subjective thing. It's in the eye of the beholder. That's why there's so many different knives in that room. What appeals to one may not appeal to another, and it's just not one thing. So what you do is you push yourselves along. The trips I made to Europe were astounding. Uh, like I said, I'm learning. I've learned so much from this guy in just a few days. I'm here, quote, teaching, but I'm here learning. And I've been walking around the show and uh, visiting with the guy that, that's next door to me right there at the table. I'm picking up information. I'm learning things. I'm packing new stuff in here. I never stop that. And that's, that's one of the things I want you to take away from this is the fact is you're all supporting each other. 
the only person that you are in competition with is yourself. It, uh, I could clone Henning's blades, absolutely clone them, and I would never be anything but a copy of his. And if I'm not as good as him, I'll be a cheaper copy of him. The only guy that can sign his blades is him. Just like the stock removal fellow that's next door to me, there nobody can do, do his work. They may emulate it. They may make a knife exactly like his. And a prime example is Bob Loveless. Back when Bob Loveless hit, you went into any knife show, and Sykes and Heather can tell you, there was 300 guys making Bob Loveless drop point hunters. And there was guys in the room that were doing better work than Bob, and they were getting two and three hundred dollars a piece for them. And uh, the top guys that had a little better story to tell, they were getting you know six or seven hundred dollars a piece for them. Bob Love was sitting over cussing at people and getting twenty five hundred dollars a piece for his because he's Bob Love. <laughs> That's the difference. That's what it is. And everybody says, well, how do I get popular? How do you get your name out there? You have a story to tell. It's not about the product. The product has to be good and you have to stand behind it, but it's about your story, how you tell your story. And a, a prime example of that is Phil Hartsfield. You remember Phil? This guy's taking a bar of A2, grinding a chisel on it, 260 grit chisel grind, wrapping the handle with paracord, heat treated, wrapping the handle with paracord, dipping it in the epoxy, and he had a Japanese film star cut a helmet with a thing named Yabata, and the people were standing in line fighting over it, $8,000 a piece in the 80s. And he couldn't make enough of these things because he had the story. That's a ridiculous example, but it's an absolute fact. He was there and you're going, how is he doing that? I mean, just, we all want to kill him. You know, he said, I'm just $300 money. He get $8,000 for a bar of steel with a head crap on it. But anyway, uh, what I'd like to do now is if, if you, I've uh, got a thing that if, if you don't ask a question, that was the only stupid question in the room. So if you have questions about this material or anything I've not covered, now's the time. Raise your hand, I know you want to. Stop in here. A perfect speech, no questions. Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody got any questions on powder? Where to get it? Uh, what to do with it? Yes, sir. <laughs> you gotta talk loud on freaking death and get it. The powder? I got it for the either Kelly Couples or uh, Jeff Carlisle at Swain Spring Service in Montana. You can speak to me. Uh, there's some loss in your post on the way from there now. <laughs> <laughs> I sent I sent two big packets up to him and hasn't arrived yet. Especially. Any more questions? I was going to refer to my chauffeur. <laughs> oh, that, I'll, I'll tell that quick joke and then I'll stop. So the fellow, this is, this is Jerry Flowers, this song from a Southern comedian. Uh, I'll give him credit for his stuff, but it's funny. And uh, he had a chauffeur that drove him. This guy was a PhD in petroleum science. And uh, he, he drove to all these and explain about drilling and uh, can drilling and uh, what the, the chemical ratios were and the different layers and all that stuff. And this old chauffeur drove with him. He said, look, we're going to that next town up here. He said, nobody knows what you look like. He said, I've heard this speech so much, I can do it myself. He said, no, you can't. He said, oh yeah, I can't, give me a shot. He said, that they don't know what you look like. And so we'll do it, so we'll trade places. And so he, he puts the PhD in the back of the room. He's up there giving his speech applause. And there's always one of those guys in the front row. And they got a pocket full of pencils and stuff. And he says, question. I mean, yeah. Well, if 85 million years ago a dinosaur died and he was in a strata under 30,000 PSI of pressure, and he was there for all that time, and you had a lime rock extrusion come down, and there was some aquifer drip in there. What would the pH factor of that oil be? He said, sir, he said, that's the dumbest question I've ever been asked to me ever in my course of giving a speech. Matter of fact, it's so stupid, I'm going to have my chauffeur stand up. <laughs> Thank